Uh, my name is Furman Balsa. Uh, I was uh, born in the town of Humboldt, which is about 10 miles east of Green Bay. And I moved to Green Bay when I was 10 years old in 1933. And I stayed in Green Bay until I went away f into the service in 1941. And I returned to Green Bay in 1946 when I was shortly after, before I was discharged from the, from the Navy in 1947. It was the year in 1934, we had what we called in Green Bay a tercentennial. That was 300 years from the time that Nicolay landed on the beach over in Red Banks, over here in a town just up the coast from Green Bay. And we had this big centennial all that summer. And the, the President Roosevelt had been elected president in 1932. And he came to Green Bay in 1934 and rode right down Irwin Avenue and out there and got out there and made his little dissertation to the whole public. And I was 11 year old boy and I was standing right there at the bottom of the podium looking at that man. Well, I was 17 years old when I joined the Navy. I turned 17 in September of 1940, 1940. And we had a division of Naval Reserves here, the 34th Division, and we also had a division of the Army here, the Battery B in the 32nd Division of Wisconsin. And, uh, well, you, it was, during a time when a youngster needed a few bucks and it was an opportunity to, to join that military organization, meet um, twice, a, twice a month and they'd give you a few shekels for showing up for the meeting and they would pay about every three months. And uh, I joined that because uh, the Battery B was already being mobilized. Uh, they went away on the 16th of October. And I, on the 6th, 21st of October in 1940, joined the Naval Reserves. I had just turned 17 in, in September. They announced to the Naval Reserves that don't make any long range plans because you have 24 hours notice that you're going to be mobilized and you're going to go someplace for some regular service to the Navy. Well, Thanksgiving came and Christmas came and uh, New Year's and we haven't gone anywhere as yet. Now, uh, a young fellow by the name of Wolford Farron said to me, why don't you and I join the rigs? And I thought for a little bit, and I said, that sounds like a good idea. We'll go tomorrow. On a Sunday night, went down a Milwaukee Road. We got on a train, and a milk train that got us into Chicago at 6 o'clock in the morning. Before we left, uh, oh, there's a little story connected with that, with my getting my permission from my folks to do this. First of all, I'm in the reserves, and my father is uh, working for a lady over on Monroe Avenue, which is probably three blocks away from the courthouse. So I'm going over there to talk to my father, who is upstairs in the second deck there, painting a lady's kitchen. And, and I said to him, Pa, I have some papers here and I have to have them signed. I'm, I want to go in the regular Navy. He said, you ain't going, you know. But I said, well, he says, you're already in the reserves. He said, uh, why don't you just stick around? I said, no, Pa, I said. Uh, Farron and I made up our mind we're gonna go in the regular Navy and I have to have those papers signed. Well, I ain't signing no papers, he said. Well, I'll tell you, it's like this, Dad. I said, now either I, you sign for me to go in the Navy or I'm gonna go someplace. Now, if I go someplace, then the only guy that's gonna know where I am is me. But if I go in the Navy, well, you'll know, the Navy knows where I am, and they're gonna keep an eye on me, so I can't get into too much trouble. He said to me, well, you gotta be between a rock and a hard spot, he said, you know. He said, uh, I don't want you to go, 
I don't want you to be in the reserves to begin with. He says, because you know there's going to be a war and you can get yourself killed. He said. I said, well, yeah, but by you can get yourself killed any place. Not quite like you can while you're in the war. He said, but he said, all right, I don't. I said, you don't have to sign. I said, I, Ma can sign because I didn't even know if my father could sign his own name. You know, I got my mother to sign and I went over there and we were going to leave on a Sunday night. Well, all the kids that I chummed around with, they were on a sleigh ride over in Red Banks. And uh, Farron and I were going to get on this Milwaukee road and we're going down to, to Chicago because that's where we're going to be our, get our physical and take our oath of office. So the instructor said to me, well, Furman, before you go, when you get there, he said, you get yourself a quarter's worth of bananas and a quarter of chocolate milk and you drink that and eat that bananas, he said, because you're a little on the light side. <laughs> I probably didn't weigh much more than 120 pounds soaking wet, you know. And so I did that, see? So Farron went right one direction, I went another direction, and we met about lunchtime. And he said to me, he said, uh, they're gonna send me home. I said, they're gonna send you home? He said, yeah. He said, I flunked. I flunked the physical. He said, I got a murmuring heart. I said, yeah, you bet you got a murmuring heart. I said, they had thrown a party for him before they put him on that train and we poured him on that train. You know? <laughs> we put him in, we, they even gave us bunks. We didn't have to sit up all night. He, so we threw him in the lower bunk and I climbed the upper bunk. And the next morning, why, he's got a murmuring heart. He's just plain hung over, you know. <laughs> So that's why he, he got on the train to go back to Green Bay and they sent me down to Great Lakes with a bunch of guys I had never seen in my life before. I think it was the most lonesome day in my whole life. First of all, they put you in a place called quarantine. That's for three weeks you can't associate with anybody else on the base. You're just in a little company by yourself. And after three weeks in that company, now you're allowed to go and eat in their main mess hall and eat with them guys and, and associate with them because you've done your quarantine period. Now I started out in Company 23 in 1941. But after I'm in quarantine for a while, I get a thing called cat fever. It's, uh, it's a kind of a consumption. Coughing, kind of like a croup or a whooping cough, you know. And uh, they put me in a hospital. Now I missed my company 23. The company 23 uh, went ahead and graduated a week before I did because I was in there a week and they put me in company 26. So I graduated with Company 26. Now, not being a real studious kid, you know, uh, they give you an uh, opportunity to go to a trade school. They give you a little test, and if you pass the test, they'll assign you to some trade school, whatever you prefer, uh, whatever your endeavor is. I didn't pass the test, so if you don't pass the test, they assign you to the fleet. Now I'm going to tell you a little story here that kids who did not pass the test and went to the fleet went on to Arizona. When I, Company 26 graduated and I took that little test and didn't get to go to trade school, they assigned me to the Marlins. It was only three ships away from where, Maryland, from where the Arizona was, but I had some guys that went through Great Lakes with me on the Arizona, and I had some guys, there was maybe close to 100 of us that went aboard the Maryland at that particular time, and it happened to be Easter Sunday. Oh my God, was that something else? Oh, you can't imagine. Here's this great big ship in this great big dry dock, you never saw, never saw so much iron in your whole life. And you wonder, how can something with that much iron in it even float? <laughs> of course, being a kid and not seeing anything like this stuff before, you know, I'm only 17 years old. I'm looking at that great big 
chunk of iron there in that dry dock, and that's gonna, where I'm going to go to the sea on that thing when we get it all put back together. That's exactly what. But man, when we went aboard there, I mean, we 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 ate like kings. We had uh, we sat at a table and somebody waited on you, and you had uh, china plates with a cup with a handle on it, you know, and knives and forks and utility, and the guy served you. But we had a pecking order. First class sat at this. There was about ten people at the table, five on either side, and there'd be. Uh, pecking order, uh, first class in the head of the table, and second class, third class, and the recruit down against the bulkhead over <laughs> So by the time, by the time the food gets down to the other end, why well, you get what's left on the plate. <laughs> but I had a happen to a kid uh, by the name of Johnny Land, I always call him my sea pappy. He was from Texas, second class counterfeit, and he sat second place on the on the table and he'd always take a piece of chicken for me so I didn't have to eat next and back. <laughs> so you see, this is the way it worked. See, and then comes payday. The mess cook that's been serving you, he puts a cereal bowl in the middle of the table and you better put something in that decides your, your loose change because he's the guy that's gonna feed you for the next month. So you made sure that you took good care of the mess cook and then the mess cook took good care and said, you got something to eat. But it was a wonderful place, I mean. But it was not a modern ship. We slept in hammock. I slept 19 months in a hammock. From the time I went in Great Lakes until I got a, a rated that is a, a, a non-commissioned, a third class petty officer rating, I slept in a hammock. Then they gave me an army cut that I put under the breach of number three gun and number three case bait, and that was my billet. When we got squared away and got through with our shakedown and all that, we sailed from the San Pedro Harbor to go to Hawaii in July of 1941. And already we knew that we had problems with the Japanese because in, in Terminal Island, and, and San Pedro, there were seven Japanese tankers laying at anchor because they had placed an oil embargo on oil and they weren't selling any oil to the Japanese. And they were trying to solve this particular thing before we never got on the same page and consequently the Japanese had already knew what they were gonna do. It was pretty much fun and games. That's what I'd call it. It, it. it was it was fun and it was a game. I mean we went out to, like for instance why did the Japanese come on December the 7th? They didn't just pick December the 7th because it was December the 7th. You know the Japanese knew more about what we were doing and we did ourselves. They knew that every year we were kind of creatures of habit. We uh, what we were doing, they, they had been doing this for years. And the Japanese had been watching them. You know, they, it ain't something that ooh, happened. It's actually, they, they knew what we were doing. They knew we were gonna have an AMI, which is an annual military inspection. On Saturday before the Pearl Harbor, which happened on Sunday, we were standing there like boards at attention as Admiral Kimmel walked up the ranks and down the ranks to inspect us on that Saturday morning. And then we had been out for a whole week. We shot our weapons and we qualified for different positions. And then we come back in and we, the red fleet chased the green fleet and the blue fleet and all these different things, you know, in these games we were playing. And then we came back into harbor, you know, and then we had this annual military inspection. And then Saturday, anybody who didn't have the duty was going ashore and, you know, having a ball, you know. Sunday morning, the guys that are sober and can move around, they're probably playing a game of golf or whatever, and we've got nobody on board ship other than the duty roster. Everybody else is doing something different. 
And I had the duty that weekend, so I was on board. Now, would you believe, I was standing on a starboard gallery deck with two other fellas, Joe Klimkak and Rocky Halstead. Rocky Halstead, a first-class cook, Joe Klimkak, a second-class gunner's mate. And we were talking about if the Japanese showed up in Pearl Harbor and they sunk a ship in the channel, all these ships that were in there, which was close to 100, wouldn't be able to get out. Do you understand how close to that truth that came? There was a fella, his name was Donald Ross. He was a warrant officer on the bridge of the, of the Nevada, got the ship underway because she had a duty that day, so she had some steam up. She was a duty ship that day, and she had her steam up. He steamed down Battleship Row, and before he got down Battleship Row, he got hammered with five, at least five torpedoes, and he had the good sense to run the thing up on the beach over at Hospital Point which it was now called Nevada Point, if you go over there. But he had the good sense to not let it in the middle of the channel. He ran it up on the beach. So consequently, we didn't block it. But that's how close we came to losing a ship in the channel, and a good sized one, you know, in the ship, in that channel. And the next thing you know, here, right, that Val dive bomber went down in front of us right here between us and the, the ship and Ford Island, which is probably from here to the street. You, you, you'd have to, you could get ashore, but you'd have to either skull a punt to get over there and get back. Uh, but that's how close to the beach we were, see? And he went right down through here like that. And I didn't know a Val dive bomber from a PBY at that time, you know. I had never seen a Japanese ship before, but I saw that one. It had a great big red ball on its wing and a great big red ball on its fuselage. And that old guy sitting up there all wrapped up in his scarf and smiling at me like as though he's on a fun Sunday drunk. He was, didn't worry about what I was doing, not a bit. And he went right over there and he turned up like this over that PBY hangar over on the south end of Ford Island. And he let go when there was this great big red ball. 